Welcome to Channel 17, the Town of Colony Government Channel. Hello, I'm Colony Town Judge Peter Crummy, and welcome to Benchmark. We'll explore a variety of issues involving our legal system, our justice system, and how they relate to the citizens of the town of Colony. Today, we are truly blessed to have with us a gentleman who has practiced law for over 55 years here in the County of Albany, who has been a pioneer in civil rights on behalf of the entire state of New York, who is busy now working on his memoirs concerning all of the activities that he has uh, engaged in in order to enhance the practice of law in the state of New York. And please join me in welcoming Peter Pryor. And thank you, Peter, for joining us today. Thank you, Peter, for inviting me and permitting me to come here. Uh, you mentioned my memoirs. It's still a work in progress, but at least I have a title for it. Uncommon Law, subtitle, The Dark Side of Albany. I call it Uncommon Law simply because back in the 50s, if you followed the law as was written and tradition, we never would have had changes in civil rights law. It's uncommon because we moved forward and beyond the common law. I call it the dark side of Albany simply because there's been considerable uh, writings concerning Albany, picturing Albany, both romanti romanticizing Albany, but we have nothing with respect to African Americans in Albany. And hopefully, uncommon law will bring about a picture of the blacks in Albany, their lives, and what they went through during the early uh, 50s uh, when I came here. I may mention, I came here in 1947. I came here during the midst of a civil rights activity. Uh, there was a big debate as to whether or not Paul Robinson should be permitted to sing at the Palace Theater. I'm sorry, at Phil Livingston uh, Junior High School. Uh, he was denied that right. Uh, a very prominent attorney, uh, uh, Arthur Harvey, uh, he brought an injunction ag uh, against uh, the city. And Judge Bookstein, who was a very prominent jurist at that time, signed the injunction order permitting Robinson to sing. It was not because they said, of course, Robinson was a communist uh, sympathizer. Uh, the injunction permitted him to sing, but it denied him the right to say anything. And it gave the city the right to uh, close the concert if he were to uh, make a speech or anything like that. And one of the things that troubled me a jurist denying such a basic right of free speech. But later I could understand why Judge Bookstein uh, did that. I'd like to mention, when I came to Albany, I came from Washington. I had spent four and a half years in the U.S. Army. Uh, I was discharged in November of 1945 as a sergeant. I was 19 when I was discharged, so I had a plenty of catching up to do. And I felt that Albany would be a place to catch up, a quiet place. It had a law school, and it had a good college, Siena, which I, from which I graduated. And uh, it was educational uh, uh, institutions and the idea of acquiring an education and becoming a lawyer, which brought me to Albany. After I graduated in 1954, and I had a big decision to make, whether or not I was going to remain in Albany or go to Savannah. And I found out before graduating 
that Albany needed a black attorney and it needed some civil rights activities more so than Savannah, Georgia. And Peter, in that way, as from an Albany Law School uh, point of view, since Reconstruction, I believe you were the first African-American graduate since Reconstruction. Is that a fair assessment? That's a fair assessment. However, I would mention that uh, a black attorney, A.D. Robert Jones, came to Albany uh, the year I graduated, and we two occupied the, uh, the stage. Of course, A.D. Robert Jones, uh, an excellent trial lawyer. His interest wasn't uh, civil rights. Uh, my interest in civil rights came from having served in a segregated army for four and a half years and also rebuilding in Albany the NAACP, which had become defunct because of uh, uh, some of the investigations done by the House Un-American Activities uh, Committee. Well, certainly your commitment to stay in Albany has changed the landscape here in the city and county of Albany and in the state of New York forever. And there's so many uh, different cases and um, that you took on, uh, took on uh, certainly uh, pro bono, okay, as um, in that way at that time there was no other way that uh, cer certain cases could enjoy the representation that you brought and early on you were involved in so many cases of um, uh, significance on civil rights issues. And I know the Mid-City case comes to mind as one that was very powerful. And also cases involving uh, Billy Brown, of course, and then Sam Clark, all part of our history. And you changed history here in the state of New York. Would you like to tell us a little bit about the Mid-City case? or? Any one of those. Well, you apparently have read some of my uh, the drafts, uh, some of my vignettes, because you have a very good handle on uh, some of uh, my activities. Well, so I'd like to talk with. Uh, I'd like to talk about Mid City simply because uh, that was one of uh, the first uh, civil rights cases I handled, and it was 1957. Uh, at that time, Mid City was a recreational park located. Uh, right on the borderline of the town of Colony in Albany, right. next to the Hawkins Stadium. Uh, the principal of that case, uh, and also the victim, was uh, Barbara Ann Sharp. She was a young uh, student at uh, Hackett Junior High School. Uh, she and her family would go to some of the ball games at Hawkins uh, Stadium. She would see some of the excitement and glamour that went on at uh, Mid-City Park. She always wanted to go there. She was an excellent swimmer, according to Dean Becker, uh, uh, Ben Becker, uh, who was the principal of uh, her school. Uh, so she, her two cousins, they went to Mid-City Park. They got in line. They wanted to purchase a ticket. But when they were reached, they were told that they couldn't swim at Mid-City Park but they could use, uh, you know, some of the other facilities, but not the pool. She remained in line. People behind her were grumbling. One woman embraced her and said, poor child, why don't you go to a place of your own? You'd feel more comfortable. But that didn't satisfy her. She felt that was a snub. She remained in line. Uh, Mr. Finn, uh, who owned the park, he moved the line over to the women's uh, dressing room. She followed, and one of the girls said, we can't sell colored people tickets. And I hate to mention this, but uh, there was a woman in that line with a young girl, her daughter probably, uh, about 11 years old. She said, Mama, I thought you said niggas couldn't swim here. And Barbara Ann Sharp took her cousins and they headed back home to Arbor Hill. No place to swim. Barbara Ann was hurt because she said, you know, Mr. Pryor, I felt that those people thought if I got into the pool, they would have to swim in an inkwell. Uh, it took four, uh, three years to, uh, to resolve that case. But it was the first time in New York State that the owner of a public accommodation or facility 
was fined and given a prison sentence if he did not obey the orders of the State Commission Against Discrimination and permit Barbara Ann Sharp to swim there. It took three years to reach that, but at the time it was settled, Barbara said to me, I won't go there, Mr. Price. It would be like jumping into the polluted Hudson. She didn't swim there, but it did bring about a change in attitude. It brought about uh, the opening of accommodations. When I talked with Barbara Ann at uh, my office, I tried getting into her head before undertaking the case. Barbara, why is it essential that you go there? Your own neighborhood, you have the log cabin at uh, uh, Livingston Avenue. Can you go there? No. Blacks are not permitted there. You have a segregated school in Sheridan Holler operated by the uh, Albany Roman Catholic Diocese. Whites don't go there, only blacks. Uh, I didn't want to tell her that my graduating class in 1954 had its graduation dinner at Keeler's restaurant. After dinner, a few of my classmates asked me to join them in a drink. Be the last time, Peter, before we see each other until we are in court. I went down with them. The bartender served them. He wiped gently the counter of the bar in front of me. And my friend Richard Williams says, give this man a drink. He says, you know we don't serve colored here. So even as a lawyer, there was no exception. Bigotry knew no boundaries. And there was a, plenty of it in Albany. In fact, uh, one of the cases I tried was uh, a little town just north of, uh, in the hill, one of the hill towns, I'll call it, okay? Uh, my client was uh, charged with several uh, traffic violations. And I called the judge and asked for an adjournment. And he granted it and all, anything that you like. What's a good date, Mr. Pryor? I gave him a date, and uh, when I went down on the, uh, the adjourned date, uh, one evening for the trial, I approached the bench and I said, would, you, would the record note the appearance of Peter M. Pryor, attorney for the defendant? The judge looked at me scornfully. You sit down, boy. You're no lawyer and I'll have you put in jail for impersonating a lawyer. I showed him my card, and he had the state trooper to go and make a phone call, and shortly after, he called us, uh, into, called me, rather, into the back room. This is a, the courthouse was really a storage uh, barn. He called me into the back room, and he said, well, they say that you are a lawyer. What do you want to do with this case? Judge, there's nothing I want to do with it. It's what you want to do with it. But I would suggest that you dismiss it. Dismiss it? Yes, dismiss it. Or maybe we can move it to a higher court where all of the facts will be known. And case dismiss. And I said, what about bail? Uh, my client needs it to pay me. I'll see that the bailiff sends you the $50 bail. Going or driving home, Willie Henry said to me, that's my client. I don't know what you said to that judge back there, Mr. Pryor, but for him to dismiss all of those charges, they weren't, uh, you know, uh, right in the first place. But you must have said uh, plenty law to him. And I said to him, 
that's what I did. We just talked the law. We talked about the law. <laughs> that was uncommon law. <laughs> uh, well, there's so many uh, well, cases that you have and uh, were that were celebrated as well, even in the press, with the with this <laughs> with the Sam Clark case, for instance, and um, and the Billy Brown case, which were well covered uh, statewide as um, uh, certainly uh, cutting edge, edge uh, cases involving civil rights and um, and had an impact here locally as well on the uh, on the uh, the practice of law uh, as it moved forward in the face of representing all citizens knowing that lawyers weren't paid uh, for civil rights activities until after the passage of the civil rights act in 1964 bear in mind that all of the work that i did was primarily pro bono and I'd like to touch upon uh, Billy Brown because while Billy Brown was pending, I also had a case against the town of Col involving the town of Colony. I had contracted to purchase a house in Colony and uh, everything is approved, but Colony didn't want any black families uh, in Loudonville, except the one that it purchased the year before, Dr. Uh, Robinson. Uh, a certificate of occupancy was denied, and that case against uh, the builder and also involving the town took about two years. The builder was bankrupt when it was over. He didn't know whether or not stick with Peter Pry and do what's right or to go against the town. So finally he went into bankruptcy. Uh, while a number of, uh, I shouldn't say a number, while I was offered uh, a sellout, I refused. Uh, Judge McCaffer fined uh, the builder $200, but that was a very small compensation. But at least it opened the door where the public became aware of discrimination in housing because and became more understanding that the discrimination in housing also involved discrimination and uh, education. And when was that? Was that in the 50s also or the early 60s? Or when uh, was that uh, issue with the uh, home? That was 57 okay. and uh, 58. At the same time that uh, you're involved in the Billy Brown case. That is correct. Uh, Billy, was, uh, Billy Brown was a sort of uh, touching case. Uh, he was stopped by the police. He was searched, spread eagle across the car. He had no weapon or anything. Police told him to go and he walked away, probably about uh, 50 feet. He was called back and police said, we're going to have to take you down to the second precinct for questioning. The second precinct? No, when you take me there, you're gonna wanna beat me. That's what you do there. And Billy ran. The police started firing aimlessly. Three shots struck Billy Brown. But the one shot, a Mrs. Mills said to me during an interview, Mr. Pryor, the police officer came up to Billy as he was laying there on the ground and shot him right in the stomach. And I picked up Billy's head in my arms and I pleaded with Billy not to die. And then she said, he tried saying something in a small voice. I couldn't understand what he was saying. But the police officers called the ambulance. They took Billy to the hospital, Albany, St. Peter's Hospital, where he died some two days later. But interestingly, the funeral cottage, 40 cars filled with people, more than 300 people, according to the Necoparka News, circled City Hall in protest. The police officers 
were not found guilty. They were not investigated. But Billy Brown did bring about a public awareness of police brutality, and it gave the public, particularly the black community, the courage to stand up and to speak up against some of the conditions on the dark side of Albany. And that was repeated again in the case of Sam Clark, a postal worker from Bridgeport, Connecticut, who owned a piece of property on Jefferson Street. He came over to visit his family uh, Memorial Day weekend, and like most families, a picnic was the thing to do. About five o'clock in the afternoon, his family returned from uh, the Six Mile Waterworks. Uh, he double parked to unload uh, some of his picnic uh, gear and whatnot. Police officer came up. You can't double park. He says, I'm just unloading my car. I live here. You can't double park. You have to move the car. So following this verbal altercation, he was arrested. He was taken to the second precinct. He stayed there for about five hours while bail was arranged. When his mother got there with the bail money, Sam was black, blue, and bloodied. His eyes all puffed up and swollen. He was taken to St. Peter's Hospital. He was treated. NAACP, which I was counsel to, and I was at that time I was counsel to the state branch of NAAP, NAACP uh, branches, uh, asked me to investigate, which I did. We met with the mayor and asked for a uh, public hearing. A public hearing was held at the Common Council Chambers at, of City Hall. I cross-examined uh, police officers. There was no question. We had doctors to testify as to the wounds. There was no question that he was beaten. Uh, the city's position was that a bee must have bitten him while he was on a picnic. You know, they have bees at the mid-city, I mean, at uh, uh, Six Mile Waterworks. Uh, maybe he had a sinus problem. and. District Attorney Jack Gary, who was uh, just a class of head of me in law school, was uh, very, uh, and a, a good uh, friend of mine, uh, we came to adversarial blows concerning uh, the outcome of this case. Uh, the mayor insisted that the police officers acted in the best interest of the citizens of Albany. Case was sent to the uh, to the grand jury. Uh, the indictment was no bill, no charges against the police officers. But it was a struggle, really, between the city of Albany and the pub uh, the uh, print media because the Knickerbocker News uh, had investigated uh, had their uh, staff. Editor Fitchenberg, uh, the Sweet Nicky, Ed Sweet, uh, the uh, reporter Ed Sweet Nicky, uh, they were all called before the grand jury to testify. They did find a wrong. They and they did a wrong because Sweet Nicky was indicted for perjury. <laughs> Peter and the officers. No bill. Nonetheless, though, you were not deterred in continuing to uh, bring awareness and legal service to a community that had well been uh, certainly underserved for many, many years. Do you believe today that the awareness uh, has been expanded and that uh, the environment and the legal practice uh, and the application of law uh, to the facts is better today than it was 50 years ago. The application of the law to the facts is considerably better. There is a greater awareness of civil rights and civil liberties and the necessity of respecting the rights of all citizens. 
I think is a part of our community culture. And I think that our community abides by it. Of course you still have discrimination. Of course you have violations of civil rights, but we can't deny that there has been a tremendous improvement. If I were to ask today, how can we make it a better system? I would suggest, number one, that we take a deep look at our judicial system, see that it is diversified, see that uh, uh, black lawyers have an opportunity to sit like you as a judge uh, because when we have a diversified uh, judicial system, when we have black lawyers participating in that system, we have black lawyers, uh, uh, African-American lawyers being a judge. Uh, it enhances respect and appreciation for the system and it brings about a greater degree of adherence uh, to the system. So those would be some of, uh, that would be my uh, recommendation. There are so many, too numerous to mention. Of course, we all recognize that 30 minutes could never begin to help us uh, understand and appreciate the uh, practice and professional career of Peter Pryor. Any particular moment or accomplishment that seems to stand out to you in a sea of accomplishments that you take um, a great pride in recognizing? Uh, in the sea of accomplishment, I'm going to be a little selfish. I take great pride in the fact that Siena College, my alma mater, recognized me for my services in the community and awarded me the doctorate of, legal, of law degree uh, back in uh, 1960 and gave me my uh, college degree diploma, which I couldn't afford to pay the $35 for when I graduated in 1951. <laughs> uh, that's, my, that's my greatest sense of pride uh, for, for, for myself. My greatest sense of pride for the community is the fact that Number one, we do have uh, two black or African-American judges. Uh, we do have a African-American jurist uh, on the federal uh, district. And I think all of these things have resulted from the movement of African-Americans in Albany and the awakening of African Americans in Albany, which from, uh, from the apathy which existed back in the early days when I practiced law. And I might add that there was a period of 10 years or more when I was the only black lawyer practicing in Albany. Well, that's why uh, so much uh, and so much of what you saw and so much of what you influenced is so very important to all of us here uh, regionally and on behalf of the state of New York. And so many other things that you do besides being in the courtroom and impacting the legal system, you've also uh, lent yourself and your time and talent and industry to so many not-for-profit uh, exercises and efforts and associations here in the capital region. I know that our Albany Law School uh, is so proud to have you as a trustee emeritus as well, which only further enhances our law school's image as we move into the, uh, uh, its uh, 175th year or so uh, as we move forward. Uh, very exciting time in the law school, and uh, I know the law school is so proud uh, to call you uh, one of its own as well. And of course, Siena College uh, here in Colony, New York, uh, and certainly your presence there allows us to call you and the town of Colony one of our own as well. And uh, we're so very fortunate to have you today uh, with us. Just a brief comment on the future of the practice of law. What would you like to see as we move forward collectively? I would like seeing 
what I can't say what I was denied, but I would like to see law firms apply and follow the anti-discrimination law uh, practice the same as corp corporations and other facilities do. Uh, I, I know that law firms think in terms of and hiring an associate, what will this associate be able to bring to the, uh, to the firm? But on the other hand, it, the, an African-American student can bring not only the same skills that a white student can bring, but he can also enhance the prestige of the law firm. There are several firms in Albany that follow that practice, but it behooves us to see that all law firms give equal employment opportunities to all lawyers. Well, and certainly your impact here uh, has been um, uh, well recognized, and we all uh, look forward as you continue to develop uh, your memoirs, uh, The Uncommon Law, The Dark Side of Albany. And hopefully, too, you have uh, time now as well to also share uh, with your uh, spouse and uh, family. Uh, you have five children. And um, your spouse, um, Barbara, is a very significant uh, leader in our community as well. And uh, together, uh, we look forward to hearing from you and your good works as we move into the future. And thank you so much on behalf of the entire town of Colony for coming here today to just share a little bit about Peter Pryor, the attorney and the um, uh, person who has uh, positively impacted the law in the state of New York. And thank you for joining me. Thank you very much, Judge Crummy, and uh, it has been my pleasure. I'm Judge Peter Crummy, and thank you for joining me on Benchmark.